Okay, I want to just uh, read one final paragraph to our last class where we were talking about um, the temptation uh, towards the wisdom of this world um, because of all of the persecution and rejection. And so just it's a short uh, couple, just two sentences. Under constant rejection, being hunted and hated, it is easy, it is easy to want to come up with some means whereby one might appear acceptable or of some worth. However, in an effort to find that place, some may become open to what the kingdom of the beast may dangle before them as a possible means to, uh, to attain prominence or more control. All right. You know, the, those are very real temptations. Um, if, it's, if, if Christ didn't form in us, I don't, I'm not talking about not having Jesus in us. All Christians have Jesus in us. But if Christ isn't formed to such a degree where it, we, what we understand is that it's, it's more him, you know, it's not I but Christ, as Paul said, um, then um, you can get fed up or maybe not fed up, just tired and looking for some answers and so that's what the last class was all about i want to go ahead and um, start on a new section here and um, the um, i guess the title i'm going to go ahead and give it early it's called uh, er the early church and transition and what i mean by that title is the early church being the church the early church, the, the first church, the, the uh, guys in the book of Acts and that sort of thing. <clears throat> but I tell you what, those guys had to make a transition from a lifelong reality and a culture of a certain reality into a new reality. And the only way they're going to make that is they're going to have to see the Lord in a real way. It cannot, it cannot, it cannot be just somebody else's teaching. Amen? We want the Lord. I want the Lord. You want the Lord. And um, so, yes, you know, I can teach. Uh, Jim can teach. Others can teach. But let's just put it this way. The Father's not fooled. You know, we may fool everybody by, because, you know, you can read, I've done this. I mean, you can read somebody's book and really appear spiritual because you just come up there and you, I mean, I could never do it, but I know people who could. They could just set, you know, Watchman Nee's book up there and they had an ability to just sort of preach it and it didn't, you'd never know. They were just basically reading the book, you know. I was never good at that, but, <clears throat> but I have studied somebody's stuff and then come up and then just shared it as if it was stuff that I had seen. Um, well, you know, that's that in itself one time or ten times or whatever is not really the issue. The issue, and I think early on, until you really, really, really see the Lord, that's what you got to do in a certain sense. You know, that's how you familiarize yourself with the thing. But you can't, you can't, let the familiarizing yourself with the reality be pawned off to you in, either by your mind or somebody else's as the reality. Because it's not. It's not. Only God can show you the reality. Okay. Because he is that reality. And to whom he will reveal himself. Um, all right. So there is, this, there is this transition that these early people had to make, and it was harder. We, for example, most of us were born, even though we may not have been born into Christianity, if you understand what I mean, your family wasn't Christian or whatever, maybe it was, we're born into a culture of modern-day Christianity. It's all around us, especially if you're from the South, you know. And... Um, uh, and, and with that uh, reality, with that culture, there is a certain way to believe. Did you know that? 
There's a certain way to believe, and there's a certain set of proofs that you are a Christian. And many of them don't have anything to do with any sort of demonstration of the life of Christ, his character, the nature of Christ, the fruit of the Spirit, any of that stuff. A lot of it just has to do with, with doing outward things that, you know, that are approved, that are, that are on the list. <laughs> do the things that are on the list, you know. <clears throat> well, the Father, you know, who's your relationship with? Because the father, he's, he operates completely different, you know. And that's, that was the beauty of Jesus. When he came, they'd never heard the name father before. Jesus comes and he goes, you know, um, the works I do are not my own, the father. The words I speak, they're not my own, they're the father's. Um, uh, I go unto the father. You know, he didn't, even, he didn't use the religious stuff. Well, I, you know, I'm going to go to heaven. He said, I go unto my father. You know, over and over and over, his, his reality was a person and was uh, so real to him um, that he, you know, it's like, you know, who am I pleasing here? The religious system? Um, I remember, I remember at a certain juncture in my walk with the Lord that, uh, I had learned all of the principles. I had learned to become a pretty good teacher, better than I am now, because I had learned to teach this stuff without knowing it by life. Not fully, not fully. The Lord had shown me some stuff, but the life of it hadn't got to me. Maybe the way or the truth had, but the life was still, you know, I was not there. And I remember that the Lord started pounding me with this thing that, that, that the Father wanted me to enter into the Son and to do that and that basically he was saying to me, you, don't, you really don't know me yet. And he convinced me of that and he, he said, you need to set your sail to know me and stop feeding religion around you and stop feeding the, the, the you know, and, and basically the religion around me, you know, was Berean. I mean, it was a good, it wasn't, it wasn't, you know, what some would call carnal Christianity. I mean, they preached Christ and him crucified and we all were laying down our lives as much as we knew how and everything. But the father was not pleased with that because he claimed it's his, it's his son in me. Do you understand? Does that make sense? That he's going, he's going, look, this is, I'm the father and that's my son. And I, that's the kind of relationship I want. Randy, could you get out of the way and let the son be your relationship with me? And I saw, I remember, and I saw that to do that, I was going to have to really look stupid in front of all the people that had, I, I had already gained a, measure of respect you know what I mean it's like number one I was gonna to have to start by saying you know what people I really don't know the Lord like I need to or like I want to or like I ought to uh, and um, instead of coming across like I'm I know anything I'm just gonna ask you guys to start praying for me that I will see Jesus and um, and I'm in it and and the father meant it too. And so he began to respond toward me as that son. And it helped me, as like, you know, I've used many times and forever will because of what he's shown me with the prodigal son, that how the father just started treating the prodigal like the son, the son, Christ. He started, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't, he didn't turn when he repented. The father didn't. The father had already turned and just embraced him and with the hope that the son would see that it's the son that he has this relationship with the father, not the prodigal or me the prodigal. You understand? A little confusing, but it's Christ in us, in other words. And I'm the prodigal and Jesus is the true son that the father wants. And so I just said, you know, I'm going to do this because this is, you know, when I see it in his heart, it's not when I see some truth, but when I see it in his heart, I'm going to go after it. And um, 
by the grace of God and, and the power of the Holy Spirit and the supply of the Spirit of Christ, I was able to um, break, break, break off, break up. <laughs> I broke up with the old system, you know. And I just decided this was going to be about a heart to heart with my father and a heart to heart with Jesus, to know his heart, and that, um, that, if, that if that ruined my aspirations of being respected, and you know, again, all that respected and stuff, that can be that, that wisdom of this age. Uh, and, and, you know, we're, we're being pulled along again with the wisdom of this age to, to um, again, Sardis. You have a name, but you are dead. You're not living, you know, you just, you just got the name of it, but you're not, you're not living it. <clears throat> well, that was me. And... Um, God's gracious, and I'm glad. I mean, I don't know what, where that would have led, but it never got me to the heart of the Lord. And uh, somebody even said, well, you know, don't you feel stupid with just a few people in the church and not much going on? And I said, I don't feel stupid at all. I, feel, I am so blessed to be with the Lord, to see the Lord, to hear Him. I have a peace that I don't know who you're talking about out there, but they don't have. And that peace isn't, well, God, get, you know, I'm special or whatever. There's a peace in being and having that relationship pure by Christ instead of based on you and your efforts and what you're trying to produce. And a lot of other stuff that goes along with it too that, you know, you, you, know, you just, money can't buy. Um, prestige or position or, or names, you know, uh, titles, I mean, I just can't buy. All right, so lest I totally talk and never cover any of this, <clears throat> let me read the first paragraph. <clears throat> Especially since class is already half over. <laughs> Whoopee! <laughs> are, we, are we having fun yet? <clears throat> All right. To, and, and let me just say this before I read this. This is a very important change now that we're coming into. This is, this is going to be the second reason why this letter was written, but it's also going to be an eye-opener to them and to us. <clears throat> All right. To understand the mental state and confusion had by the early believers as set forth in the seven churches of the book of Revelation, it is important to consider the early concepts they held concerning the coming of Messiah, or Jesus Christ, Christ meaning Messiah <clears throat> in the Hebrew. It must be remembered that the first followers of Jesus were all Jewish. This means that, and here, here it comes, this means that the early church believers, their belief system before meeting Jesus was the same as every other Jew concerning the Messiah. Exactly the same, because why? They were Jews, now they're saved, but their concept of the Messiah and the coming of the Messiah has not changed. You see, all right. <clears throat> It is also important to take note of the conditions of the time in which Jesus first appeared. Together, these two factors will help shed light as to why there was an air of discouragement among early Christian believers. <clears throat> All right. Around the time when Jesus was to appear, the nation of Israel was under terrible bondage. Their land had been invaded and occupied by Roman legions. The Roman Empire forced the belief upon all slave nations that Caesar was God and was supposed to be worshipped as such, that Caesar was God. And um, uh, needless to say, Israel resisted this. The Jews also bore heavy tax burdens laid upon them by the Romans along with tight restrictions of every sort. 
The reaction of the people of Israel was to hate the Romans. In the hotbed of these circumstances rose a greater desire on the part of the Jews for God's promised Messiah to appear. Okay. All right. Okay. Now, that's, that's true historically, but folks, that becomes true spiritually in a certain sense, too. Okay. <clears throat> Especially if our concept of Jesus, the Messiah, is wrong. Because we start looking for something that's not going to show up. And I'm going to expand on that, so don't worry if you didn't fully, fully get that. <clears throat> All right, so the next subtopic is the Jewish expectation con concerning Messiah. And folks, this applies. This isn't just a history lesson here. This is exactly what most Christians are going through nowadays compared to the charismatic movement some 15, 20 years ago when... Everything seemed wonderful. <clears throat> the Jewish expectation was that with the arrival, here, here it is, with the arrival of the Messiah, the end of oppression by their enemies would also come. That's what they believed. Okay. They viewed these two events as one and the same. When the Messiah comes, the oppression ends. Okay. In their minds, this is what the coming of the Messiah consisted of. This, you know, that's how you know the Messiah has come. Because all of the bad stuff goes away. Okay? <clears throat> Under the weight of all this oppression, they were crying out to God that he would hurry the time when Messiah would come and bring judgment to their enemies. There's not a Jew who was alive at that time. But that wasn't their hope. When they cried out for Messiah, they cried out for judgment upon their enemies. All right. Again, I'm building another from another angle. They were ready for the situation to be reversed so that they would be given power over their enemies while their enemies would be subjugated to them. Well, anybody ever, you know, anybody ever in school and had somebody bully you and you were hoping for the day when you would have power over them and, you know, you know, or not school, but this or that, or some cruel leader like, you know, your pastor of, new creation or, you know, I'm not talking about me, I'm talking about Jim, but you know, uh, you know, the control freak. <laughs> but, you know, there, I think we've all been in situations, and maybe we're not Jewish. Maybe we're not looking for the Messiah to come in that situation between you and your boss, or, but you're looking for Jesus to come. And in many cases, you're looking for the situation to be reversed, and that's the proof that Jesus showed up. All right? <clears throat> um, the principle behind this is not new. <clears throat> uh, but is common among fallen mankind, and that's what we have to see. Okay. What we're talking about is the book of Revelation. What we're talking about in relationship to the book of Revelation is not just a bunch of end time prophecy that may not affect us if we don't live in the end time. We're talking about things that are common to human nature whether you're a Jew that became a Christian or, or you're an American that's upset with your uh, uh, boss 
or spouse or whatever, or you're a you know, Cuban who's upset with, your, with the dictator. It doesn't matter. These things apply across the board because they apply to human nature. <clears throat> Fallen mankind was my wording there. Though they held religious beliefs that were particular to their own nation, talking about the Jews, yet the thought processes of the Jews in this matter were very similar to that of other nations. And I, I've got a scripture here, and I haven't looked this up in a little while, but it's John 4, John chapter 4, verse 25. Okay, yeah. This is the woman at the well, and she's speaking to Jesus, and she says, The woman saith unto Jesus, I know that Messiah cometh, who is called Christ. When he is come, he will tell us all things. We're going to get it all figured out. No. Everything's going to be wonderful. Clearly, we haven't got to that time yet. Can anybody see why one reason why people wouldn't accept that Christ is here now, they're more interested in waiting for him to come because in their mind, their comprehension of the coming of Messiah didn't get fulfilled yet. Now, I don't want to bear, I don't want to beat on that drum too long because that's not my main point, but that scripture shows you that there was this um, Jewish expectation concerning the coming of Messiah. <clears throat> okay, later we find that this same belief system uh, was also held by Jesus' disciples and by early church believers. All right, now that's an important point because the early church were Jews who became Christians. The belief systems that the Jews held were drug into the early church. Does that make sense? All right. Uh, and the example here is the book of Acts chapter 1, if you want to turn there. If you don't, you don't have to, because I will read it to you. And if you want, I'll stick a bottle in your mouth too. I'm teasing, I'm teasing, I'm teasing. <laughs> Acts chapter 1 and verse 6 and 7. Now remember, this is Christians now, formerly Jews, if you will, formerly Jews in religion, still Jews by culture, but Christian by religion, if you will. Verse 6, Acts 1, when they therefore come to, came together, they asked of Jesus, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom of Israel? And he saith unto them, it is not for you to know the times or the season which the Father hath put in his own power. <clears throat> I thought it was an interesting way that Jesus responded to that. He says, it's not for you to know the times and the season, but he didn't really say, well, that's really what you should be thinking about, or that's coming, or that's gonna happen. He said, really, you shouldn't even be worrying about that kind of stuff. <laughs> you know, he could have said, well, that's just wrong thinking. You disciples, you're not Jews anymore, you're Christians, but you talk like idiots. But he didn't do that. He did. You know, his, his, his goal is to fasten them with principle that comes by life. You can learn a principle in a class, but you need to pray that the Holy Spirit will work that into you as life because, because, because the goal is not to, uh, it's not like a, a uh, you know, military man that's got, you know, bullets going across here, a belt back here and going across here and got guns here, you know, and basically you're, you're equipping him with all of this ammunition and stuff, all these principles so that he'll be able to, you know, be Rambo for Christ, you know, <clears throat> Rambo bright, <laughs> you know, but instead um, he is, he will release a principle, uh, except the corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone, but if it dies, it brings forth much fruit. 
But that doesn't mean it. They may even embrace that principle at that point. It's not until the Holy Spirit comes and begins to impart that as life. You know, just knowing a seed falls in the ground and dies, you know, at best makes you a farmer. <laughs> you know, but, or, and at worst makes you a Pharisee. Because you're trying to live by the taught principle instead of having it worked in you as, you know, as a self-giving life that knows what will come as a result of this. Does that make sense? I hope that makes some sense. Um, okay. While the nation of Israel longing, uh, with the nation of Israel longing for deliverance, suddenly they hear of John the Baptist declaring the imminent appearance of the Messiah. All right. This is, this is big. This is huge. They're in bondage. They've got Roman legions walking their streets. They're, they're told that Caesar is to be worshipped as a god. They're, all this oppression is on them. They're taxed to the max. <clears throat> and, um, and they're all frustrated and wanting a Messiah to come because they're in their mind when Messiah comes, we'll rule over you instead of you ruling over us. Okay? So what happens? All of a sudden, John the Baptist is out, man, and he's out preaching, and he's talking about the this imminent appearing of the Messiah. Oh, my God. This plays right into the hands of, you know, whoo this is it. This is what we've been waiting for. This was what the ones before us were waiting for, and the ones before us, and the ones before us were waiting for. Um, so... Then within a short amount of time, stories arise of Jesus and his disciples and how mighty supernatural, supernatural manifestations follow him. All right. So I mean, I'm trying to set you as a Jew in that, that setting. And first you hear John the Baptist, and then you hear about Jesus, and then you hear about these disciples with Jesus, and then you hear about, which is a following, and then you begin to hear about, you know, all these miracles and stuff. Um, these voices were proclaiming that the kingdom was at hand, which was a sign of the arrival of their Messiah. All these things lifted the expectation of the Jews that deliverance would soon be at hand. Because why? Why did it lift the expectation that deliverance would soon be at hand? Because that was their understanding that when Messiah showed up, bingo, Everything's going to be put right, and we're going to be on top, and the bad guys are going to be on the bottom. Can I get amen on that? I mean, that's the, that's the general thinking today about Jesus, much less, you know. <clears throat> All right, so after the resurrection of Jesus, voices rose even more strongly. After his resurrection, they rose even more strongly that he was the long-awaited Messiah that, you know, and this is what they began to say. The Messiah has come. This was the Messiah. Jesus died and he rose again and he is the Messiah. He's the Christ. <clears throat> they were told that this Messiah had joined all tribes and nations into one family and that the kingdom of God had begun. This is what everyone had been waiting for. Because of this, there were many Jews who had become converted to Christ because of this. Because the Jesus that rose was, you know, and this isn't proper, but I'm going to say it like this. The Jesus who rose was Christian. Now, he wasn't. He was Christ, and we're joined one with him, and there is no Christian. You can wipe that out if, as far as certain understanding of things. But um, he, he arose as it were, outside of the Jewish thing or inviting all, not just the Jews, to it, and that became known as Christianity. So, okay, so again, I'm, I'm, I'm having to stop and make sure that we're following this. So here they are, their expectation is the coming of Messiah. All of a sudden, and they've got all this hard bondage and stuff going on, 
And so all of a sudden they start hearing of John the Baptist, then they start hearing of Jesus, then they start hearing of all the miracles and stuff. Then they hear that he died, but then they hear he rose again. And with that resurrection, people are saying, he's the Christ, he's the Christ, he's the Messiah. This is the one. So it's getting even louder and stronger. So everyone's going, okay, well, we want to be the Messiah because he's going to turn this thing. If he's the Messiah, he's going to turn this thing and he's joined all nations and tribes and everything. And so people started coming to Christianity. Now, it wasn't that, as some think, they didn't come in droves. The vast majority of Jews did not convert. There was only a remnant. Only a remnant. But those who did, in many cases, were being influenced by the fact that this bondage was going to end and this Christ was going to change the direction of everything that's going on. <clears throat> All right. Um, so though converted, yet they had not yet been converted in terms of their belief system concerning the appearance and purpose of the Messiah, Jesus Christ. Okay. They got saved. <clears throat> they trusted him for their sins. They trusted him that, they, that the punishment had been borne by him and they wouldn't be guilty before God anymore. But one thing that didn't change was their concept of what the coming of the Christ meant. It didn't change at all. It was the same old Jewish belief system. Okay? <clears throat> All right, so the next subtopic is, let's see. Does anybody have any questions before I go on here? Does this make sense so far? It's, uh, even though we haven't come to the big conclusion yet, it's real important that we understand these steps because, um, because they're going to, number one, they're going to be the key, one of the keys, to the book of Revelation. And the book will just go, yep, 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 yep. If you don't understand it, then you're gonna look at the book of Revelation the way you always did. What? Oh no, oh God, well, I don't wanna read it anymore. You know, what we want is, we wanna see the Lord, but the Lord is being ushered in um, in the book of Revelation on the wings of the problems of the seven churches. That's how it starts, doesn't it? That's how the book starts. Why? Why would it start with that? My God, won't you encourage us? <laughs> you know what I mean? Lord, encourage us. Don't tell us everybody's problems. The church is in a mess. We, you know, we're dwelling where Satan dwells. We're, you know, you got all this stuff and you're going, you know, here's the average Christian. Well, it'll get better at the end. Way, way at the end. That's your, that's your, Christ, that's your basic Christian concept that came out of a Jewish concept. Yeah. Yeah. 
there's only one bit in my mind with the Stephen. Yeah. Because of what he said. See, he saw the reality as it was. And so he, he showed them who they were and he didn't know. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. Because, because it was such a uh, smack in their face. Yeah. Yeah. Because it meant that it Well, and that's, that's, you're really right, you're really, you know, you're on the train, brother, and you're just riding it right to where the Lord wants to take us. I'm just telling you. That's exactly, I couldn't ask for it said any better as far as, you know, seeing where the Lord is trying to take us because, and basically, I'm, I'm sure because we don't have all the microphones that uh, people on Skype couldn't <clears throat> fully hear uh, Robert uh, sharing, but the basic gist of what he was sharing was that, you know, one of the hardest things for them to break with was that power, and especially under the circumstances that they were in uh, when the Messiah showed up, that they, want, they wanted out, and they wanted victory, and they were tired of being the dog that was kicked, and they were tired of being uh, looked down on, and they were tired of the rejection, and they were tired of, you know, and, uh, you know, you got to look at Israel, they were just this little bitty country compared to the Roman Empire that spread basically, well, the known world, um, and uh, so they're, you know, uh, and then think of this, okay, now, a whole, maybe, maybe more people than became Christian that were still Jews before Jesus died were thinking, well, maybe he is the Messiah. Maybe he is. I mean, there was a whole lot of people there shouting Hosanna to the king when he came in. You know what I mean? A lot of people go, Hosanna, you know, and all this kind of stuff. So, though, you know, we're for him. And in a very short amount of time, they're yelling, crucify him. Um, with the death of Jesus in their minds, in many of their minds, ended any thought that he really was the Messiah because why? Well, he was powerless. He couldn't even stand up against the local authorities, much less the powers in Rome, Caesar himself, and you know, all the generals and the legions of all that stuff. <clears throat> so to them, this was a joke. Okay, that's 1 Corinthians chapter 1. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 1. That's the weakness of God is stronger than men already. That's showing that in his death, he can defeat all armies, but they're looking for it to happen in a certain way. And then mainly in what Robert, I think, was trying to say is that that, that would empower them. And uh, he even made the statement that... Um, you know, out of all the religious things that he's tried to knock off of himself, one of the hardest has been that thing of getting power and being able to overcome and being able to, you know, um, um, uh, have your role reversed over your enemies instead of them over you, you over them and that sort of thing. Well, if, if you're following this like a storyline, the pages are turning right into that same thing. And these seven churches, they have, uh, they have been faced with the same thing. But, but the story we've told up to this point is what the Jews went through. We are about to make the transition into the Christians. And guess what? Because the Christians never broke with that Jewish culture and concept concerning the Messiah and what Jesus meant when he would show up. They're in confusion. They're in defeat. They're, they don't know what to do. And, and you know what, I'm just going to end it with this. And they are finally, because of all of this, at a point of susceptibility to the knowledge and the system of the beast. Okay. Now, that system's already around them in the form, in many forms, but certainly in the form of the Roman Empire. So God's going to have, because they don't see, they don't see all of that. They don't see that to become a certain way is to become exactly like that, the beast. Well, I'm doing this because 
I'm right. Do you understand what I'm saying? That a person will say, well, I'm going to do this. I'm not going to do this and be like the beast. I'm going to do this because that person is wrong. <clears throat> or I'm right. You know, you can do that in one relationship with one person. Well, they're just wrong. So, you know, I'll just, you know. And, 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 <clears throat> and the Lord through John is trying to paint a picture that is so vivid that they look at it and go, Oh my God, you know, we, we are the beast unless the Lord really break through. <clears throat> so anyway, we'll, we'll close with that. Father, we just ask you to continue to move. Thank you for um, uh, your heart and your sharing, Lord. And I know that we are on the verge here of, of really beginning to, to see now what it is that you want to reveal in the book of Revelation. We know it's your son, but... Lord, there are many aspects the book of Revelation brings out. And so, Father, we ask you to, Lord, keep us, keep us hungry and keep us listening. Because you said, he that hath an ear, let him hear. Lord, keep our ear listening. Don't let us get bored. Don't let us turn away. Lord, forgive your poor servant here who is not so good at, at uh, getting the communication across, but give them mercy, Father, to hear what your spirit wants to say to the church. And so we, we cry out to you. We open our hearts and we ask you to open our eyes and open our ears and open our heart unto you more fully so that, Lord, we would not be in darkness as other men, but that we would walk in the light of life in these things. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You're dismissed.